So today I'll be talking about reliable interpretation of essentially what you might think of as unreliable or stochastic DNA evidence. Next slide. Thank you. So in nature, we have uncertainty. Uh, all data that we get in science is not completely reproducible. If you were to reamp data and see exactly the same peaks, you'd know there'd be a mistake, uh, for example, in the file. Re reproducible DNA data exhibit stochastic variation. The question is, what do we mean by reproducible? I'll discuss that in the next few minutes. Probability models can capture the stochastic nature of the data. And in all methods of interpretation, including mixtures and uh, protocols that you follow, uh, in, implicitly or explicitly, genotypes are inferred from these uncertain data. And they are all probability distributions. Uh, even inclusion is a probability distribution. Science expects us to account for the stochastic effects somehow, and the law expects us to testify within our certainty. Uh, the likelihood ratio and all match methods are likelihood ratios, including CPI, uh, meets the demands of both science and law. And that's the measure that we'll be using in these studies. Next slide. At the heart of the randomness of the data that we see in nuclear DNA is the polymerase chain reaction. Inherently, every cycle, you have a number of copies of DNA that exist. And in that branching process at each cycle, either the, there's a copy made or there isn't a copy made. And the, since the efficiency is not 100%, P is not equal to 1. And the result is a random distribution of what you might observe in a peak. Next slide. For example, under the same conditions in the laboratory or in a computer simulation, an STR peak is a random variable. With one amplification, if you keep doing a number of cycles, you may end up with 1,300 copies. Another amplification, you may end up with more than twice that. Next slide. So what we really are getting is a probability distribution of the peak heights that reflects the underlying quantity of DNA. If you were to do a, a thousand or two amplifications of the identical template, or again, do it on a computer, you would get a probability distribution. Here we see one that covers maybe half of the distance. So this is representing the amount of DNA, which is measured on a fluorescent sequencer as a peak height, uh, and horizontally for right now. And that distribution is characterizing our uncertainty, uh, and in some sense, it's capturing it if you use uh, quantitative interpretation methods. It has a mean. It has a standard deviation. And that's describing quantitatively the extent of our uncertainty. Next slide. One way of understanding the extent uh, of our certainty is in a single number, for example, the coefficient of variation, which divides the standard deviation by the mean value. So what's an expected value of an amount of DNA or a peak height? What's the variation that we see? So the long bar in green is the extent of the average peak height. One standard deviation shown in red, if you take the ratio here, uh, 12 over 85, you get a coefficient of variation of 14%. Again, this bell curve of peak distributions is taking up about half of the distance from baseline up to the maximal peak that you would see. Next slide. On the other hand, if you quadruple the amount of DNA or the peak height, you get twice the peak certainty. That's basic statistics or chemistry. Four times the, uh, the quantity will give you twice the precision. And you see that if you do these experiments in your lab or if you do them by computer simulation. So here we've quadrupled up to 350. We have a much greater quantity of DNA. Um, and the standard deviation has halved, giving us a coefficient of variation. Uh, actually, sorry, the standard deviation has doubled. Uh, and by doubling, dividing by quadrupling, we end up with a halving. And that's reflected visually that we're now taking up a quarter of the distance from baseline up to the maximum peak, whereas before, with a quarter of the DNA, we had taken up half of that space. So there's more of a concentration of probability of where that peak height will be around the mean value as there's more and more uh, DNA. Next slide. 
The result is that if you think of this as STR data, here are different sizes. Now we're looking at it in the normal way. Here's RFU. These are probability distributions. So when we observe a particular peak height, the peak height that we see is a sampling from a probability distribution. With taller peaks, more of the probability mass is concentrated in one area with very far from the baseline, with, with smaller amounts of DNA, that probability mass is more diffuse on a relative scale to the baseline. You see how uh, the, where the peak could be is covering half the space to the baseline, whereas here where the DNA could be is covering maybe only um, a quarter of the space. So to, how do we interpret quantitative data that has uncertainty? Um, some groups, as we were hearing, possibly yours, like to use quantitative thresholds. And in that method, uh, one threshold is, is applied to the data, and peaks that are over threshold are treated as bona fide allele events. Those that are under threshold are discarded, and the result is, is the quantitative data uh, is reduced to a list of alleles that are included. You're all familiar with that, right? <laughs> Next slide. However, since nature is providing us with peak events that are samples of a probability distribution from the PCR of the underlying DNA, the instant we do something that's not working with the probability distribution itself, but we start drawing lines, we introduce inherently error. The reason is, if you draw a threshold, either when you sampled from this dis distribution, you, if you sample on one side, there's a, a false um, negative error. If you sample above the line, then there's a positive. It's clear, more clear at 200, where these are real events. They really did occur, but you're choosing not to see them. You're now, they're now invisible. The instant you draw a line, you've created a statistical test that casts everything on one side of the distribution as an error, and, or everything on the other side as an error, depending whether or not you observe the peak event or not. Before you drew the threshold, you couldn't be wrong. It was just probability. Once you create the threshold, now there's a pro there is a definite way you can quantify your probability of error. Next slide. So we did some experiments on this. This involved uh, 40 mixture samples uh, from a nanogram, a uh, half, quarter, eighth of a nanogram uh, at five different uh, mixture proportions. Uh, 10, 90, 30, 70, 50, 50, 70, 30, and 90, 10 uh, for two different pairs of individuals. So overall, this was 600 loci. And what we measured is uh, what was the false allele rate? What's the false negative rate? Uh, it measured in terms of the number of uh, alleles that were missed per locus. Okay, so that's the measure, alleles. So one over here is 100% missing of, uh, of how many alleles there would be per locus on average. You see with 50-50 mixtures uh, and a lot of DNA, the error is low. But even with a, with a reasonable amount of DNA, 500, 250 nanograms, with an imbalanced mixture, the error rate is getting up to 100% of the number of uh, incorrectly missed alleles per locus. Next slide. That was at a threshold of 50 RFU. Uh, when you use stochastic thresholds and you raise the level to, say, 150 or 200 RFU, then the peaks that are under threshold begin to disappear from your review, uh, as do the um, criminals you're trying to detect and identify. And the result is there's no genotype, there's no match score, and there's really nothing left to say to uh, police, prosecutors, or society, because the data is now invisible to the interpretation method. It's there, but you're not seeing it with thresholds. Next slide. The result is a higher false exclusion rate. If the threshold goes up from 50 RFU to 200 RFU, then on the, the same uh, 600 low side that we looked at, here again is uh, one false negative allele per locus, basically for all the data, you're up at around 50 to 100% of what you're going to be missing. That's, 
So for example, for a minor 10%, uh, 90, highly imbalanced, two-person mixture, most everything is, on average is at 100% or higher, regardless of the DNA concentration of how many alleles will be dropped out. Next slide. You all familiar with the new SWIGDAM guidelines? The new SWIGDAM guidelines in paragraph 3.2.2 provide for this and say that if you're using quantitative data with probabilistic genotype methods, uh, then if you empirically support it, then you can essentially ignore the rest of the document. That's what it, that was what it says. Um, if you do that, if you don't do that, if you're just guessing and looking and playing with thresholds, then you can't. Uh, and the reason for it is that it's known that higher peak thresholds will discard information and probability modeling uh, as done by a lot of groups around the world, uh, in, if you read articles on this, uh, can preserve a lot more of, of the identification information. Next slide. So what is probability modeling? Well, I need to step back and say that even threshold methods use probability modeling. They just use a very uh, uninformative likelihood function. So all interpretation methods fall into this. You usually begin talking about this when you use quantitative data. At the heart of forensic science is Bayes' theorem, which is a way of addressing scientific uncertainty in most fields of science and social science. The idea is to use likelihood functions, I'll show you a picture of one soon, to update our probabilities. You start off uh, assuming that there's a, you don't know anything about an individual's genotype, so the probability distribution is that of the population. You see data, you update your beliefs. Uh, in, with mixtures, there, can, there will remain ambiguity often with single source. Your belief can be focused on one allele pair. A joint likelihood combines independent evidence, whether it's from independent peaks within a locus or across loci. The purpose of a likelihood function is to tell us how well parameters explain the data. I'll give an example in a second. And with STR data, what we want to explain are the peaks. Formally, a likelihood gives the probability um, at one peak, and when you combine them, you can explain the whole pattern. Next slide. So here is how one could propose a genotype. Here's a, con a mixture with two alleles in blue from one contributor and one allele shown in orange from another contributor. And you could propose a certain amount of DNA mixture. You could also propose, as uh, we do in our systems, uh, stutter, relative amplification, degraded DNA, and so on. And then ask, how well does the pattern compare with the peaks. The peaks are probability distributions. By trying out every possible pattern based on every possible genotype value, including the ones that you don't see, because maybe there's dropout, uh, across all possible mixture weights, all possible stutters, degraded, everything across all the data. It's this, this is not for the faint of heart. Or if you don't have a computer, forget it, right? Because um, the computer's trying out billions of things. Those patterns that better explain the data have higher probability. And therefore, the genotypes that produce those patterns have higher probability. That's the heart of all modern statistical computation. Uh, everything gets tried out, and whatever better explains has a higher likelihood that produces. So this is a likelihood function that you're seeing, accounting for stochastic data of any height, including baseline. Next slide. What's interesting is that all variables, not just genotypes and allele pairs, but also stutter, prefamp, and importantly, peak variation, can be solved in the same way as a probability distribution. So the distribution of the data, how confident is this peak around every observed peak as well as around baseline, can be modeled and as just one more parameter in the data, you know, in the formula for a bell curve, you have the mean and the variance, right? The mean's a parameter, the variance is a parameter. Computers can solve for both as probability distributions. So with modern computation, the certainty of every peak in the data can be computed. And that's how you can use quantitative likelihood functions in a reliable way with quantitative data for mixtures and other problems. Next slide. So TrueAllele is a system that implements this approach. Uh, there are others in the world that do this. 
It, it's quantitative computer interpretation. It does a statistical search across all the, all the parameters in the probability model, all the possible genotypes that all the contributors they get in the mixture weights, degraded DNA, stutter, and so on. The goal is to preserve all the identification information present in the data. It objectively infers a genotype, never seeing a suspect who wouldn't know what to do with it, actually. And then after it's inferred the genotypes, uh, it's put into the genotype probability distribution is put into a formula, and a likelihood ratio is computed. It can handle any number of mixture contributors. I don't think we've gone beyond five in our studies. Stutter, peak imbalance, degraded DNA. It calculates the uncertainty of every peak. If a computer does not compute the uncertainty of every peak, don't bother using it. Just use thresholds, because your results will be unreliable and destroyed in court. Uh, the system is over 10 years old, now in version 25. We've used it on over 100,000 evidence samples, including the World Trade Center. For re, uh, to reprocess that data. And uh, anyway, you might want to use it is fine. Usually groups would begin by sending us uh, one or two interesting cases, maybe with a very low max score, or where you know in your heart something's there, but you can't do anything with it. And then you're going to win charge for this. You send it to us. We analyze it, do a webinar with you, and walk through and show you what we found with the report. There have actually been some convictions that resulted from test cases that people sent us. Somebody, they would present the defendant, the suspect, and say, look what we found. OK, I confess. That's actually, so it's kind of wild. Next slide. Uh, this was the first case that I know of in the world where statistical computing was used for DNA. I testified in this a year and a half ago in Pennsylvania. It was a 7% two-person contributor. The unknown was under someone's fingernails, a homicide case. The inclusion score by a national laboratory in the US was 13,000. And Trulial produced a score about a million times more. Uh, and the whole theory was presented in the, in the admissibility hearing, explaining why peak thresholds discard information, whereas probably prob probability modeling preserves it. Next slide. And in this case, this is one locus. I think it's VWA. This is, this is what's happening. Suppose you have three alleles. And in this case, with a 7% mixture, you have some very tall peaks from uh, the victim, some very small peaks hanging around. And, and with a CPI or RMNE, all the alleles are considered to have equal standing as in or out, and the victim's not ignored. So of the three possible alleles, there are six possibilities. And the result is the inclusion method disperses its probability over all the allele pairs, including the ones that are obviously incorrect by visually looking at the data, whereas a quantitative method like true allele forms a likelihood function that, after its calculation, focuses the probability on the true allele pair value, the true genotype. And when you focus probability on the right allele pair, then you get a higher match statistic. Next slide. Uh, this wasn't just this case. Uh, incidentally, uh, er I'll give you the URL at the end, and also the slides are on our website uh, for the talk as a handout. Uh, th so these papers, this one is with the New York State Lab. It's coming out in JFS uh, next fall. We showed on their cases with CPI and uh, CLR methods that on the sa here on the same eight cases, the average max score using a quantitative true allele was about 10 to the 13th. This is always on a log scale. And whereas the reported CPI value is 10 to the 7th. So we now expect to get about a million to one improvement in match score on cases where people can produce a result. Next slide. SWIGNAM also provides for combining evidence. And here, a joint likelihood function is useful. Next slide. Uh, this is a case I testified in over the summer in England, uh, the Queen versus um, an arsonist. Uh, this was fascinating data. If you can believe it, this is all amplifications of the same um, locus, of the same template. With three contributors, they look a little bit different. It's enhanced, uh, which is why these peak heights are actually really all below 50 in the real world. Uh, and when we looked at it, the human result was inconclusive. And with the true allele interpretation, next slide. This is what we found. If you consider just the locus VWA, in brown, that's the prior probability. That's before you saw the data. 
after the computer spent about a day processing this, half a day, this is a very hard case, uh, we, using a lot of different evidence, the joint likelihood function was able to combine that evidence, and in blue, that was the posterior distribution. Now, we don't know, the system doesn't know who the suspect is, but at some allele pairs, there's a gain in probability. At some, there's a loss. It turns out at this locus, that's the suspect's genotype, and there's a gain of six-fold. Multiplying across all the SGM plus loci in this case, the joint value is over uh, 3 million, accounting for population substructure at 1%. Next slide. In a larger study with New York State, we looked at about 85 items of evidence. And what we found, as you see on this blue curve that's descending, is that the computer always produced a match score. This is 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 10th, and so on. People put a match score to the data. And New York's a really good lab. They have a threshold of 50, or had until the new guidelines. Uh, and they ver very aggressive lab and very clean in their analysis. They were able to put a match score about 30% of the time to to the evidence. Uh, and when they did, unless it was treated like an RMP, there was a loss of information. Uh, in fact, if you look at what was left with the peak threshold methods, uh, they were unable to make a statement over 70% of the time putting a max score to the data, whereas the quantitative methods were able to preserve the information all the time. Next slide. So in conclusion, quantitative data has stochastic effects. If it didn't, it would be drawn on Photoshop. It wouldn't be real. All nat in nature, all data has stochastic effects. That's good, because with modern probability, we can model the data using joint likelihood functions, as is done in hundreds of other fields. The probability modeling exploits the stochastic effects once you've tamed them and captured them by working out their probability distributions to preserve identification information. And statistically, using methods hundreds of years old, rigorously combine the DNA evidence when you use quantitative data. By doing an exact modeling of the peak variation, it can replace inexact thresholds and scientifically overcome stochastic effects. Uh, we have a number of papers, and uh, this year has been a banner year. I think I've given 10 pre talks this year, so starting at AFS, which talks about the Foley case and uh, the New York State validation back in February. We have movies of everything with the slides. If you don't want to listen to my voice, we have the transcripts as well and the handouts. Uh, but it's all on our website under information, along with preprints of all the papers and manuscripts if you want to read about the methods, the validation studies, and so on. If you're interested in seeing how it works on cases that intrigue you, uh, send me an email, and we'd be happy to take a look at it and show you uh, what quantitative interpretation is all about. Thank you.